In this video, we're going to prove an important equivalence involving um, conservative vector fields and path-independent vector fields. So let's look at some definitions first. So we say that f is a conservative vector field if f is equal to the gradient of little f, where little f is some scalar um, multivariable function. And then we say that f is path independent if the line integral um, of f over the curve c1 is equal to the line integral of f over the vector over the curve c2, where c1 and c2 are any two curves with e with equal initial and terminal points. So just to sketch out what's going on here, let's go ahead and say that we've got a vector field which is given kind of by these arrows right here which I'm drawing. Great, so that's maybe part of the vector field. And then we have a point here which is maybe an initial point and a point here which is a terminal point. And C1 is something like this curve up here and maybe C2 is this curve right here. So both of those curves are going through the vector field and we say that this vector field, which is this thing F, which is given by these orange arrows, is path independent um, if this line integral over the line C1 or the curve C1 is going to be equal to the line integral over this curve C2. Okay, so now that we've sketched a picture of what's going on a little bit, um, let's look at the theorem that we want to prove. So the theorem says that F is a continuous vector field on an open connected domain. So that's our setup. Then F is conservative if and only if F is path independent. So this is what we want to prove. So um, let's go ahead and notice what we need to do here. So this is an if and only if statement, which means we have two things to prove. We have a forward direction and a reverse direction. So let's go ahead and get started on the forward direction. Okay, so we're going to do the forward direction. In other words, we are going to assume that F is conservative and then prove that F is path independent. So let's see what we need here. So let's go ahead and suppose F is conservative and we have two curves, C1 and C2 are curves um, parametrized by maybe we have a vector function um, R1 and a vector vector function R2 and then in order to force them to have a same initial point and starting point let's say that they're parametrized on the interval um, T from A to B um, and for them to have the same initial point we need R1 of A to be equal to R2 of A and then we also need R1 um, of B to be equal to R2 of B. Okay great. So just to get a picture idea of this let's say we have C1 is given by this yellow curve and so uh, every point on this yellow curve is of the form R of T where T is running through um, A to B and this point back here which is the initial point will be R of A maybe R1 of A and then over here this point is R2 of B sorry R1 of B so that's the final point but then if we have another curve which maybe we'll draw in blue like that. So notice it's got uh, different middle points, but the same initial and terminal point. So uh, we know that this is the same thing as R2 of A. This is the same thing as R2 of B, but in the middle, this R2 of some random T is not going to be the same as this R1 of random T. So we've got same initial and terminal points, but different points in the middle. Okay, so now that we've got this set up, let me erase this little picture, and then we'll do the calculation. So now, uh, since F is conservative, um, we can apply the definition of a conservative vector field 
um, and that is there exists a function little f such that um, capital F is equal to the gradient of little f. And that little f is called the potential function. So now let's do our calculation. If we take the line integral over the curve c1 of f dot dr, that's going to be the same thing as the line integral over the curve c1 of gradient of f dot dr. But since C1 is parameterized by R1, and we know something about the fundamental theorem of line integrals, this is going to be F evaluated at that ending point, which is R1 of B, minus F evaluated at that starting point, which is R1 of A. Okay, great. But now we know that the ending point and the starting point for C1 and C2 are the same, which is exhibited by, in the vector functions given by R1 of B equals R2 of B, and the same thing for A. So that's going to give us F of R2 of B minus F of R1 of B. But now, again, applying the fundamental theorem of line integrals in reverse, that's going to give us the line integral over the curve C2 of gradient of little f dot dr, which is equal to the line integral over C2 of our capital F dot dr. Now, if we examine the extreme left and right-hand side of this equation, we see that's exactly what we need for f to be path independent. So notice we started with f as conservative and we ended with f as path independent. So in other words, we've proven this forward direction. Okay, so now let's move on to the reverse direction. Okay, now we're ready to prove the reverse direction, which, which actually we're only going to do in R2. It's a fairly similar exercise to do in R3 or R4 or Rn really in general. So since we're uh, working in R2, uh, we want to suppose that we have a vector field in R2 that's path independent. So we'll do that in the following way. Let's suppose that F is the vector field made with component functions p and q, um, and it is path independent. And so we want to show that it's conservative. In other words, we want to show that it has a potential function, and that's exactly what we will do. We'll construct through a variety of steps um, a potential function for this thing. So I have partitioned the board into two spots. One spot where I'm going to write the words for the proof, kind of an outline, and another spot where I'm going to kind of draw what's going on. So the first thing that we want to do is um, capital X in F and fix it. So this is just some uh, point which we have fixed inside of D, which recall D is the open connected domain um, of our vector field. So let's go ahead and draw D over here. So it's like this blob shape, that's what we're going with. Good. And then uh, here X down here, I'll say that it is this point. Okay, now the next thing that I want to do is um, let little x, y in D be arbitrary. So this is like our variable point. So this x is like our fixed point. This x comma y is like our variable point. So I'll go ahead and put our variable point right here. I'll call it x, y. Great. Now, the next thing that we want to do is exploit um, the openness of our domain D. And since D is an open domain, any point inside of D can have a disk around it which um, is completely contained in D. So any point including the point X, Y. So let's go ahead and find a disk uh, centered at x, y um, that is contained in D. And then just 
Like I said, we can do that because D is open. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw the disc around X, Y in red, and I'm gonna maybe make it a little bit bigger than you would, because generally you think about these discs um, for openness as being quite small. Notice if X, Y is like super close to the boundary, then you have to make it small, but uh, just in order to get a feel for what's going on here, I'm gonna make it big. So I'll go ahead and underline this in red to say that here is our disc centered at um, X, Y that's completely contained in D. So the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna go directly left of our arbitrary point X, Y and uh, to a point A comma Y. So here's what I've got. This is A comma Y. And I know I'm allowed to go left and not get outside of my disc because again, this uh, disc has a positive radius. It has a non-zero radius. So that means I can go a little bit away. So uh, now let's go ahead and um, write that out. So we'll find some number A, which is less than X, such that um, A comma Y is in this disk. Great, so we've got that going on. Now, from here, I wanna construct uh, my curve, and I'll construct my curve in the following way. Okay, so my curve's gonna go like this. It will start at X, and it's going to end at X, Y but it's gonna go through this point A, Y and make its last portion of its travel horizontal. So let's go ahead and you know, you know, give it a little bit of um, interest at the beginning, so make it a little bit curvy, but then if we go up here, it's gotta go straight horizontal. Great, so now let's write that down here. So take a path C, uh, which is uh, from capital X to X, Y uh, through A comma Y, and it's horizontal um, from A, Y to X, Y. And then here I'll go ahead and write C is C1 union C2. So I'll go ahead and just write here that this is C2. So the component which is horizontal is C2 and then the component before that is C1. So this is our picture so far. Okay, so I'm gonna hold on to this picture and then uh, I'll erase uh, these, this outline and we'll move on to the next part. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is consider the following function. So let's consider this function x comma y, which is given by the line integral from capital X to xy. So notice the line integral from capital X to xy, that's definitely going to be a function that depends on xy. Recall that capital X was fixed, but little xy was chosen to be variable. And so uh, we'll do this in two stages though. So it'll be the uh, the integral along C1 and then the integral along C2. So this is going to be the integral along C1 of f dot dr plus the integral along C2 of f dot dr. Okay, now we, what we wanna do is take the derivative of this f with respect to x. So I'm gonna write that as um, f sub x, but then this is going to be the partial with respect to x of the integral along the path c1 of f dot dr um, plus the partial with respect to x of the integral along c2 of f dot dr. Okay, good. And now here's an important thing that we want to notice, and that is the line integral along C1 doesn't depend on X at all. And that's because C1 goes up to this point A comma Y, but this A coordinate, which is in the X spot, is fixed. So we have this part down here is fixed, and this A spot is also fixed, which means this is only... Um, a function of y, and so if we're taking the derivative of something that is only a function of y, we're gonna go ahead and get zero there, okay. But 
Um, this thing most definitely depends on x because notice that x value is changing as we're going from here to here and here x is a variable. Okay, now what we want to do is um, calculate this line integral of f uh, over c2, but c2 is given by this line segment um, a to x and y to y. But notice that's really easy to parameterize. Now you could parameterize this using our starting point and ending point strategy, but there's actually a much easier way to do it in this case. And notice we can just take this to be t comma y. So notice the y coordinate is going to be constant with respect to the, uh, t, I should say. And then notice the x coordinate is going to go from a to x. So here this is parameterized over the interval a to x. But no notice that is going to make r prime of t equal to 1 comma y. Sorry, 1 comma 0. Great, but that's going to make the magnitude of r prime um, equal to just one because the magnitude of that vector is clearly one. That's a unit vector. So now what we can do is use our formula for uh, the line integral over a vector field to change this into the partial with respect to x of the integral from a to x because that's what our parameter goes from, a to x of f, um, which recall f is equal to um, p comma q, and now we need to dot that um, with our vector um, r prime, but notice our vector r prime is just one zero, and then integrate with respect to t, great. But notice uh, that is going to give us the partial with respect to x of the integral from a to x of p, and I'm going to make sure to put this as of t comma y dt. Great. All right, so now what I want to do is erase this bottom bit of the board, um, bring that up a little bit, and then we'll continue on. Okay, so we're at this point, but this is just screaming for us to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, which is from calculus one, and notice this is going to give us just p of x comma y. In other words, the partial with respect to x of um, this function that we've defined is uh, p of x, y, which is the first component of our vector field. Now, we're not going to do all of the details for our second component of our vector field, but we will sketch what we would need to do. So, we would need to find a point right below xy that is contained within this disk. So, maybe let's put that point right down here, like that, and we'll call that thing x, comma, b, maybe? Great. And then we can take another curve, which is split into two parts. It's split into this part, which takes us to x comma b, and we call that maybe c1 hat. And then it's split into this vertical part, which we would call c2 hat. Great. And then we could define... Um, <coughs> the integral over c1 hat of f dot dr plus the integral over c2 hat of f dot dr. And notice that um, c, which is c1 union c2, and c hat, which is c1 hat union c2, hat, those are curves with the same initial and final point. That combined with the fact that capital F is path independent means that this line integral is the same as this line integral, which means they both have to be equal to the same function. And then finally, we will calculate F sub Y, and notice that in this case, this part's going to be zero because this doesn't depend on Y. And we're just left with uh, the partial with respect to y of this thing, which we can parameterize the same way that we did before. We'll get the integral from b to y of q evaluated at x, t, dt. 
but that gives us exactly q of x, y as needed. So in other words, we have found um, a potential function for our vector field. In other words, our vector field is conservative. All right, that's a good place to stop.